Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm told that we need to start right on time, and uh, and it's a pleasure to welcome all of you to this um, this breakout session, which is uh, which is focused on the establishment clause and church-state separation and those cor those kinds of issues. It's it's we've been given a title called "What to Expect After Lemon," which kind of raises the question: Well, is is Lemon gone? Lemon refers to a Supreme Court case called Lemon versus Kurtzman. Uh, that we'll talk about a little bit in a, in a couple of minutes. Uh, I'm the moderator. My name is Gene Scher. I, uh, I'm a, I, I work at a law firm in, uh, in, in Washington, D.C., uh, but the most enjoyable part of my career is that I get to teach the very smart law students here at the law school as an adjunct professor. I teach a, I teach a Supreme Court clinic here as well as a, a, a religious liberty advocacy course, um, and that's really kind of the the highlight of my week is to be able to, to interact with students, but I also love my law practice. Um, we, are, we are joined today by three panelists who are going to do the vast bulk of the, uh, the speaking. I'm going to introduce um, uh, Stephen Collis first, um, who's in the middle. Uh, Stephen is a, a noted First Amendment scholar and, a, and an excellent author. He, uh, he's a professor at the University of Texas uh, Law School, and he also runs the First Amendment clinic there, and uh, he's written a book that, that I'll give a little plug for that I, that I ask all of my students to either read or listen to. It's called uh, Deep Conviction. Um, I have it on my, on my phone, on my, <laughs> and, I, and I listen to it often as I'm riding my bike. It's a beautifully written um, sort of treatment of, the f some, of four of the major religious liberty decisions throughout American history, and, uh, and it's, it's beautifully written and very informative. Um, and uh, we'll hear from Stephen second. Uh, we also have uh, two other people on our panel who are, who are representatives of, uh, of two of the most noted and most successful public interest law firms that, uh, that litigate in the church state area. Um, uh, Daniel Benson works at Beckett Law and, uh, and is a, a counsel there, and uh, Bradley Gerard. Is uh, is a counsel at uh, at Americans United for separation of church and state, and you know, as as all of you who follow religious liberty realize, uh, the establishment clause of our Constitution mandates a certain amount of separation between church and state, and uh, and these two gentlemen are often on opposite sides in trying to decide exactly how much separation. Uh, there should be, but uh, but it's important to our legal system that we have very competent people represent, representing both sides of those debates. So we're uh, uh, we're delighted today to be able to have have two people who are very experienced at uh, at, at litigating those issues. Um, I uh, we agreed that I would begin just by giving just a very short bit of background on our topic, and then we'll uh, we'll let our panelists really give the. Uh, Give the meat of the uh, meat of the substantive discussion today. Um, I'm going to begin just because uh, I think it's useful to uh, to begin with the language of the constitutional provision that we're going to be talking about here, which my computer does not want to show me. Let's see. Well, this is a new computer. I did not, uh, I guess I didn't get it, get it set up. Ah, no? It's on my computer, but it's not there. Anyway, as you all know, the, uh, the Establishment Clause says, and you religious liberty lawyers can probably quote it, right? Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of, of religion, right? And so when you, uh, when you look at that passage, it's kind of odd in a couple of ways. First of all, by its terms, it applies only to Congress, right? Only to the federal government. By its terms, it doesn't, it doesn't apply to the states. Uh, of course, the Supreme Court has, has held after the enactment of the 14th Amendment that it was incorporated into the, that the Bill of Rights, or most of the provisions of the Bill of Rights have been incorporated under Supreme Court decisions against the states. Uh, the other thing that's a little strange about that language is it doesn't say Congress shall make no law establishing a religion, right? It says Congress shall make no law respecting 
the establishment of religion. And you may wonder, why, why would they choose that language? I mean, it seems to suggest that Congress can't pass any law on that subject, right? It, not uh, either, either pro or con. And, it, and in fact, the, there's a historical reason for that, and that is that at the time the Bill of Rights was written and ratified by the states, there were several states that actually had established churches. Um, that you know that were state supported uh, uh, state supported faiths and uh, and and originally the, the you know one of the main purposes of this uh, provision in the establishment clause was to tell Congress you can't muck around in this at all some states have have established religions you can't make them give them up uh, other states don't you can't pass a law that requires them to and of course you can't establish a a federal or a national church for the whole current country you just have to stay out of it um, so so that's the you know that's a, a very small piece of the history yeah you had a question you're right I I did that from memory and I <laughs> I did it wrong. It is it is respecting an establishment of religion, and in some situations, that's an important uh, that's an important difference. So I apologize for that error. Um, so anyway, the uh, uh, the uh, what happened is that after incorporation of the establishment clause against the states, uh, the the U.S. Supreme Court, um, you know, gradually. Broaden the interpretation of uh, of this provision, kind of gradually broaden the interpretation of what constitutes an establishment of religion, and they extended that to two basic categories of government activity. One is any financial assistance to religion, which had, which included uh, schools. That that was where a lot of the contra controversy was for a while: is how much assistance can local governments and state governments provide to uh, to religious schools, especially uh, Catholic parochial schools. So that was one area. And then another area in which there's been a lot of litigation is situations where the government engages in or facilitates religious expression of one kind or another. And those, those are the two main categories of cases in which, uh, in which this provision has been interpreted and applied by the Supreme Court. So those efforts reached a major milestone in 1971 um, in this case called uh, Lemon versus Kurtzman. Thank you to whoever got my computer to work for me. <laughs> uh, this is what the Supreme Court looked like in 1971. So they were the people who, who issued this decision. It was written by uh, Chief Justice Warren Burger, who's in the middle there. And, uh, and here's what it said. Um, you know, this was sort of the the money quote from the case, or the where the 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 court kind of articulated how it was going to go about deciding the case. Every analysis in this area must begin with consideration of the cumulative criteria developed by the court over many years. Three such tests may be gleaned from our cases. First, the statute must have a secular leg legislative purpose. Second, its principal or primary effect must be one that neither advances nor inhibits religion. And finally, the statute must not foster an excessive government entanglement with religion. And uh, I actually, um, I, I, I had the privilege of clerking on the Supreme Court. And, uh, and my first boss there was Chief Justice Berger, who was actually the author uh, of this language and, uh, and of this decision. And, uh, and I, he, he used to like to go just walking around the court just to get just to get exercise, and he would invite me to come walk with him, and we would talk about a range of things. And 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 uh, one day I kind of screwed up my courage, and uh, and I wanted to ask him about lemon, and you know, kind of what was he thinking there? And, and uh, um, so I asked him, you know, tell me how it how it came to be, and the and and when I mentioned the word limit or lemon, he kind of got a little incensed and he said, you know, so many people think that we were trying to artic articulate a general legal test there, but all we were doing was just kind of explaining how we had, uh, you know, how we had reached our conclusion. Um, and uh, he, it, needless to, he was not quite the legal craftsman that Justice Scalia was, uh, for whom I clerked, uh, clerked next, uh, and I, I wanted to say, <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to say, well, Chief, did you read what you wrote in Lemon? 
because <laughs> it sure sounds, looks and sounds like a test. Now, the, you know, the, the other real irony of that, of that decision and that language, and then we'll let our, our panelists uh, jump in, but, but the real irony of that is that the first two tests that are articulated there were really just dicta because the holding of Lemon was that the particular program that was at issue there, which was a, a system of providing financial aid to, uh, uh, to parochial schools, uh, was the, the court held that it, uh, that it violated the excessive government entanglement prong of Lemon. And so they could easily have decided the, t the case just by saying, you know, one of the things that we've recognized is that if a, if a government program fosters excessive entanglement with religion, then that's a violation of the Establishment Clause. And, you know, they could easily have just left it there, but, but they had this, you know, this uh, three-part test. So that uh, uh, the Lemon test, as it's known, has been under some pressure in the Supreme Court. Is that, is that a fair description, gentlemen? It's been under some, under some pressure. Uh, in, in, the, uh, in the Supreme Court. There, uh, there are two cases that are pending before the court right now that are going to likely be issued uh, before, uh, before sometime in mid-July, maybe even next week, that, uh, that raise significant Establishment Clause issues and where the court may actually weigh in a little bit more about, uh, about the status of Lemon. So with that, we'll turn the time over to Daniel. Uh, thank you, Gene, and thanks to BYU for, uh, for having me here today. Uh, my name is Daniel Benson. I'm an attorney at the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty. Uh, Lemon essentially represents a shag carpet and lava lamp understanding of the Establishment Clause. <laughs> One that's a product of and stuck in the 1970s and hasn't been updated since. It's also a constitutional anomaly breaking with what came before it and hopelessly in conflict with what the Supreme Court has done since and in conflict with what an establishment of religion was understood to mean at the nation's founding when the Establishment Clause was written. For this reason, the court has for about the last 20 years abandoned Lemon, not relying on it, holding instead that the Establishment Clause must be interpreted by reference to historical practices and understandings. However, until the Supreme Court formally overrules Lemon, lower courts, local government officials, litigants, and others continue to rely on it because that's what they're familiar with to the detriment of religious liberty for all people. So first, what came before Lemon? What was Lemon breaking with? The founding generation knew what an establishment of religion was because lots of them came from England where there was an established church and I think nine of the, 12, of the 13 colonies themselves, at least at some point, had an established church. These establishments varied in, in some of their details. Some were much stricter, some were much more tolerant of dissenting views, but they shared a lot of similar characteristics. That included government control over the doctrine and the personnel of the established church, mandatory attendance at the established church, punishment of dissenting churches and individuals, restrictions on political participation for dissenters, preferential financial support for the established church, and government use, uh, government use of the church to carry out civil functions. So in, in the Supreme Court's first modern Establishment Clause case, which was in, uh, in the late 40s, um, the, both the majority and the dissent looked to history in trying to understand what an establishment of religion was. Now, I personally would quibble with some of the conclusions that they reached in their opinions, but interestingly, both the majority and the dissent, though they disagreed on their outcome, both were very much engaged with a historical understanding of what an establishment of religion mean at the time that the First Amendment was written. Then in another landmark case, and um, a, a couple of decades later, uh, Walls versus the Tax Commission, uh, the court upheld tax exemptions for religious property, and again, looked to a 200-year history of how those were an important part of, uh, of protecting uh, churches and religious organizations from government interference. And the famous quote from that case, a page of history is worth a volume of logic. Then in 1971, uh, I believe, comes Lemon. The court cites just two cases from the past three years, 
No discussion of the nation's history, no discussion of what an establishment of religion may have meant at the founding. And from, from those two cases in the past three years, the court gleans this, uh, this test that, that Jean talked about. Um, and in later years, they modified that test to focus uh, also on whether the government's action could be considered to endorse religion, with not a lot of guidance as to what it would necessarily mean for the government to be endorsing religion. Now, unsurprisingly, this test, which apparently in the eyes of Chief Justice Berger wasn't meant to be a test for, for always and forever, uh, but that seemed to be applied that way, it was found to be malleable, inconsistent, and, and unpredictable. So a couple of examples. Un under the Lemon Test, uh, it, was, it was determined that the government could lend books to private schools, including both religious and non-religious private schools. But it could not lend maps. Someone famously quipped, well, what about atlases? They're books of maps. How, how do we know whether, whether that's a, vi a, a violation of, of the Establishment Clause? Over the course of many years, a number of, a number of things uh, inconsistent with, with a historical understanding were found to be establishments of religion under the Lemon and Endorsement Test. A World War II memorial in the shape of a cross uh, that had been standing um, for decades. One of the judges in, in the lower court suggested, well, why don't we solve this by ripping the arms off the memorial and turn it into an obelisk? Uh, dis and despite we have a long history of religious symbols appearing in public along with many non-religious symbols as a natural, normal part of, of human culture. Um, Jean also mentioned um, di other displays like uh, Christmas nativities or, or Hanukkah menorahs. Cases coming out widely divergently. Maybe if you had enough reindeer and Santa Clauses next to your Christmas tree, maybe it was okay. Maybe if you didn't have enough reindeer and Santa Clauses, then it wasn't. Um, so this test, difficult to predict, difficult to know how how the courts would apply it. And so the easiest outcome, the, the easiest solution for a lot of local government officials to avoid liability, to avoid getting sued, is we better just err on the side of caution and exclude religious organizations from being able to participate in funding programs. We better exclude religious speech uh, from the public square to make sure that we're not running afoul of the lemon test or the endorsement test that we're not really sure how to predict whether or not something is gonna be considered an establishment of religion. So now, how, how is the Supreme Court, if it's, if it's not, if the Supreme Court is not applying lemon today, how, what is the Supreme Court typically doing in its cases now? Well, a majority of the court has held that the establishment clause must be interpreted in light of historical practices and understandings. That case, uh, that quote came from a case called Town of Greece versus Galloway. And the question there was, can a town council open their meetings with a prayer? Uh, under, the, under the lemon test and the endorsement test, a lot of courts had said, no, you can't, because if it looks like the government is saying that religion's a good thing, they're endorsing religion. But in Town of Greece, the court looked to a historical tradition and said, you know what, the very same Congress that passed, that wrote this language, they opened that legislative day with a prayer. They obviously understood that that was consistent um, with not having an establishment of religion. Uh, and the court again uh, reaffirmed this principle that a histor historical practices and understandings are at the core of understanding the Establishment Clause in another case called American Legion versus the American Humanist Association. It involved this cross that I mentioned where the lower court had suggested, well, why don't we rip off the arms and turn it into an obelisk? And the Supreme Court said, we're not applying lemon. We're instead looking to an, uh, our nation's tradition of allowing recognitions of the divine in public and that being a natural and normal part of our nation's history and human culture. So the Supreme Court now, it's been some two decades since they applied lemon. Uh, 
in, in cases, another category of cases where they, they no longer, they have not been applying lemon in some time, are these school cases. Uh, the court now tends to, to focus on whether religious and non-religious groups are both permitted uh, to participate equally in, in these funding programs. And in fact, in multiple cases, the Supreme Court has said, not only do you not violate the Establishment Clause if you allow the religious organization to participate in this program, in fact, if you exclude them and discriminate against them, you're violating the Free Exercise Clause. And two recent cases, um, one is the Trinity Lutheran case that involved government grants for playground safety equipment. They said, churches, sorry, if you have a playground on your church-run school, you're not allowed to participate in this grant program. And the Supreme Court said that violates the Free Exercise Clause. Discriminating against uh, religious groups and religious people because they are religious is not prohibited, is not allowed by the Constitution. And the court again reaffirmed that same principle um, in, a, in a case just a couple years ago called, called Espinoza. So if the, if the court is no longer applying Lemon, at least it hasn't in, in some 20 years, uh, does Lemon even matter anymore? Well, the U.S. Supreme Court has never formally overruled it. And so what ends up happening, as I mentioned, lower courts continue to apply it, litigants continue to cite it, uh, and it continues to play an effect in how government officials make their decisions. For one final example that I'll offer is a Supreme Court decision that just came out um, a month or two ago. Shirtliff versus the city of Boston. In this instance, the city of Boston has three flagpoles that are in front of their city hall. On one of them, where they have Boston's flag, for some 10 or 12 years, I think, they had a program that allowed private organizations, if they wanted, they could come on a day, they could fill out an application, and they could hold a little ceremony, and they could put up their own flag on this flagpole instead of the city of Boston's flag. Boston approved nearly 300 such requests. They had flags of foreign nations, they had flags of, of community organizations, they had pride flag, they had even a flag of advertising a local credit union. But when a, religious, when a religious group wanted to put up a flag that they called the Christian flag, for the first time in the history of this government program, Boston said no. And Boston was very candid in its reasons. It said the only reason it was saying no was because it was worried about violating the Establishment Clause. So what happened in this case? The US Supreme Court, nine to zero, said Boston violated the free speech clause when it denied this organization its ability to put up its flag. And for our purposes of this discussion of Lemon, most interestingly, a majority of the justices also said the only reason this case happened in the first place is because Boston misinterpreted the establishment clause. And it wasn't just who you might think of the more conservative justices who said that. Justice Kagan and Justice Sotomayor at oral argument also said, Boston made an establishment clause mistake. They thought if they allowed this organization to put up its, its, religious, its flag with a religious symbol, that that would violate the establishment clause. And so though this case, again, this case did not formally overrule Lemon. It wasn't presented explicitly with the opportunity to do so but another nine to zero opinion saying, you can't exclude religious speech from the public square because you're afraid of violating the Establishment Clause. Uh, so I, uh, the court has more opportunities to come where it's presented uh, with these types of questions. And for the, for the benefit of religious liberty for all people, uh, hopefully at some point the court will come around to finally putting the nail in the coffin and saying that, that Lemon is, is overruled for good. Your extremely loud voice is going to be a great asset one day, but right now, shut up. <laughs> and I have found that in these types of panels, uh, my extremely loud voice actually is just fine sitting there, but I will go to the microphone. Um, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here and to see a Stranger Things t-shirt in the front row. And uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to know that there are such intelligent people in the crowd. 
Uh, also, just excited. I, I have to warn everybody, I apologize, but I've got an event in Salt Lake City I've got to get to immediately after this, so I'm kind of literally just going to sprint out the door so I won't be able to stay behind to talk to, to folks. Um, uh, Daniel finished talking about the city of Boston and how the Supreme Court scolded them for misinterpreting the Establishment Clause, and my immediate response was I made a note to myself to say, I really don't blame Boston because quite frankly, I think the Supreme Court has left nothing but a trail of confusion for like 200 years about what the Establishment Clause means, and so I want to just talk a little bit about that. So some of this, I, I'm sorry, will be a little bit repetitive. Um, as uh, the sister uh, over here caught, uh, the Establishment Clause says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. And just to be clear, in case, in case this has gone over some folks' heads, an establishment of religion generally is a state church. It's not a religion that's been established. Right? That matters a lot. So Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. And the question, of course, is, well, how far does that go? I think everybody agrees there can't be an official state church in the United States. But where we go from there, there's just vast disagreement. There's been vast disagreement over time. And these two are probably constantly fighting with each other. So it's fitting that I, as the academic, am in between them on the table um, about what the Establishment Clause really should mean. There are, are uh, some people who take the view that if you look at that language, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, that actually what it was designed to do was to keep the federal government out of messing with then existing state religions. Now, 25 years ago, that was a fringe theory that really only a few people bought. Uh, Justice Thomas had bought into it a little bit, and then a few other people, but most people didn't think of it that way. Most people believe that it also, it also that, that, the, that the provision also had an individual right to it. In other words, that it prevented the federal government from establishing a state religion to protect us on an individual matter, that it was an individual right to be protected from a state religion. So you've got some people that say, well, it was only there to keep the federal government from interfering with state establishments. And so really, if we're going to go back to originalist thought on this, states should still be able to make state establishments. That's what some people think. Um, I disagree with that. I do think there's an individual right not to have a state church, and there's a lot of benefits to that. So um, if we're going to say that the Establishment Clause should apply to the states, right, it should limit how much states can create a state church, then we have to ask the question, well, what does it mean? And there's all sorts of theories that have been proposed over the years. Daniel went over some of them, but I'm just going to... Uh, kind of give you a sense of where a flavor of some of the proposals that have been out there and that the Supreme Court has like kind of adopted in some instances but not very clearly straight away from in other instances but not very clearly kind of they, they tend to just pull out whatever's convenient for them when it works and then ignore something when it doesn't. So some of the various theories that are out there are one is the coercion test. So that argument goes you know, a state government or a local government or the federal government only violates the establishment clause if they are coercing people into religion or coercing religion on people. That's one theory that's been thrown out there. Another one is the historicity test, which is this idea that, well, if something's been around for a long time, doesn't matter what it's doing, we're going to keep it. But then they don't really explain what happens if the government tries to put something new out there. So an old cross will let stay on government land and government can maintain it. If government tries to build a new cross, uh, we just won't talk about that. So it, they, they have that test is not exactly helpful, but it's out there. Um, others really argue on this, uh, argue that what the Establishment Clause means is that government can never endorse a religious belief or a religion. And that if any government actor, including a public employee, endorses a religion or religious belief, that would violate the Establishment Clause. So that's an easier way to violate it than a coercion test, right? You can endorse religion without engaging in coercion. And most people, there's a lot of people out there who think endorsement should be the test. Others have argued that it's strictly a no entanglement provision. We shouldn't have church and state entangled together. And as long as they're not entangled, that'll be, th then there's no violation of the Establishment Clause. Still others have said, well, absolutely no funding to religious institutions. If there's any funding to schools or churches that have playgrounds or anything like that, that's a violation of the Establishment Clause. And still others have said, well, as long as the funding is neutral, it's given to everybody the same, then it's not a violation of the Establishment Clause. So there's all these tests that have been proposed by academics, proposed by litigants. The courts adopted some of them and not others. It has not done so very clearly. What the court tried to do in Lemon, despite Gene's old boss protests, 
is create kind of a one-size-fits-all test, right? He may have not thought that's what he was doing, but that's absolutely how it's been interpreted over the years. And, and so you had this idea that, well, we can, we can have Lemon to kind of solve everything. The problem with Lemon is it was horribly unclear. Uh, it self-contradicts itself. So if you look at the two prongs of Lemon, or the, the, two, the second two prongs, one of the prongs of Lemon says, the primary effect of a statute must neither advance nor inhibit religion. So if you've got some government program, it can't advance or inhibit religion. The next prong says, the statute must not result in an excessive government entanglement with religion. Well, in order for government to know that its statute is not promoting or inhibiting religion, it then has to get entangled with religion and monitor where its money and things are going to know whether or not it has, ha it has violated principle two. So you've got these principles that contradict one another, right? You'd get government programs giving money to schools, then the government coming in and saying, oh, by the way, you've got to open up everything to us and we're going to track our money to make sure we're not advancing religion thus entangling uh, government and religion. It was a real problem, and the Lemon test, what it did is it resulted in a whole string of cases into the 1980s that uh, are really just a mess. Many of them have largely been overturned, and so I won't spend a lot of time on them, but they resulted in these ridiculous outcomes like what Daniel said, like government could provide books to religious schools but not maps. Government could provide funding for religious schools as long as that money was used in outdoor trailers but not on the actual structure of the building. Those are the types of decisions that were getting spewed out in the 80s as courts tried to apply lemon and make sense of it. And it really led to a lot of confusion. So the Supreme Court has since stopped really referring to lemon, um, unless it's convenient, then occasionally they'll refer back to it. But usually they've kind of gone in another direction. It seems like at times they've applied the endorsement test. It seems like at other times they've relied on coercion. In other tests, they've relied on this historicity test that I mentioned. Um, there, the, the problem is that there are just too many different types of cases, I think, this is my opinion now, for a one-size-fits-all approach to figure out where there's an Establishment Clause violation. And so my own view um, is that the court has effectively overruled Lemon without saying so. And I will be shocked if this term, they explicitly overrule Lemon. There are certainly some justices who want to, probably, for sure, probably two and maybe three, who might even put that in writing. But I don't think you're going to get a majority of the court this term explicitly overrule them. And I think it will always be around. And as Daniel said, it will always be pleaded. Um, the question, though, is where should we go from here? And by the way, I'm, if I'm wrong on that, I'm happy to be wrong. Maybe they'll get, maybe they'll overrule Roe and Lemon all in the same term and it'll just be utter chaos. But my guess is if they're, over, if they're planning on overruling Roe, they're going to just pretend like Lemon doesn't exist and ignore it. Um, so that said, where should we go from here? Well, my own view on this is that um, any one test trying to apply it to all the various situations where you might have violations of the Establishment Clause really doesn't work. Take the endorsement test, for example. There are people who say you can never have government endorse religion, a government actor endorse religion. That works really, really well, in my opinion, if you've got, say, an official state speaker. So, for example, if government has a billboard, and that billboard says, Buddhism is the only true religion. It's a ringing endorsement of a religion and, and, and violates the Establishment Clause. But on the other hand, we have seen in Canada where the government there in Quebec, in the province of Quebec, was so afraid of this idea of employees, public employees endorsing religion on behalf of the government, that they have banned public employees from wearing any type of religious garb in all sorts of settings. So what that means is, is that in the province of Quebec, you've got public employees um, from various religions, such as um, Hindus, Sikhs, Muslims, Orthodox Jews, very devout Christians, who cannot serve as public school teachers, postal workers, government bureaucrats that like the motor vehicle department, because their religions require them to wear outward garb and the government is saying, we are so afraid that that appears to be an endorsement of religion, we're not going to allow it to happen, right? The, the endorsement test in that scenario results in absurd outcomes. In my opinion, what makes, what makes probably far more sense is to have what I would call a disaggregated establishment clause. That means the establishment clause cases fall into certain categories. We have situations with what do we do with public land and facilities? What do we do when you have an official government spokesperson what do you do when you have public employees, and what should you do with government funding?
And I think a separate test for each of those situations can actually solve a lot of, this, a lot of these problems, give us some clarity, and it allows places like City of Boston to not act in such a terrified manner when they get an establishment clause case. Most, uh, Daniel, I think, is right. Most governments are so terrified of violating the establishment clause, most of their lawyers are not specialists in this area. They try to go do research. They come back confused out of their minds. And so what they do is they err on the side of caution, triggering seven years of litigation. Uh, we don't need that. I think the Supreme Court can provide more clarity. The problem, of course, is they're not going to provide the kind of clarity I'm calling for in one opinion. Uh, but I do think trying to do what they did in Lemon has resulted in nothing but confusion. And over time, they need to find a way to provide more clarity in each of the different types of cases so government actors and private citizens can know how to move forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you to my fellow panelists, and thank you to BYU for having us, um, for allowing me to be a part of this uh, fantastic day. Um, as Jean said at the beginning, my name is Bradley Gerard. Uh, I am a lawyer at American United for Separation of Church and State. Um, I repeat that just because I want to make a point that um, you know we are an organization that believes that a, a robust separation of church and state is necessary to protect everybody's religious freedom. Um, I'm happy to have heard Chris this morning talk about Roger Williams uh, because he was one of the best advocates for church-state separation. Um, and he was coming from the perspective of how it protects religious practice. Um, <clears throat> so from our perspective, religious freedom also means um, per, you know, protecting the rights of religious minority faiths and the non-religious too. So I want to just make three points that are going to be a little different um, from, from what the others have talked about. Um, first, kind of what's underlying Lemon. Um, second, why the court hasn't gotten rid of it. And third, uh, what's next and the kind of potential problems. Um, as, a, as an initial note, I think it's easy at, at these events to, or, or these kind of panels to uh, abstract away to talk about cases and doctrines, but to lose sight of um, what's really important, what's at stake. So <clears throat> I'd like to focus less on specific cases or specific examples or kind of the concrete development of the law and a little more on what I think are the uh, important principles at stake here. So <clears throat> with all the criticism of Lemon, I do think it's critical uh, especially in light of the topic of this conference um, and of you know the inspiring remarks that we heard this morning at the opening session, um, to to think about the purpose, right? So we heard three opening speakers this morning who all spoke about religious liberty, but from very different perspectives. One thing that tied together those statements, uh, at least for me, was an idea of the outsider. Um, the outsider, both a religious outsider and a non-religious outsider. And the thought of how religious freedom can and should protect that outsider. And that is what I think the Establishment Clause generally, and Lemon specifically, is really getting at. There's an unfortunately prevailing thought that the Free Exercise Clause and the Establishment Clause are kind of directly in tension. There are at least five justices of the current court uh, that think so. Um, but I think when properly understood, they work in unison, um, protecting the rights of everyone to be free from undue government in, uh, interference in or support of faith. Um, because support of one faith necessarily comes at the expense of others uh, and at the expense of those who aren't religious. I'd like to contrast two countervailing views of Lemon uh, and its underlying logic to show what I think the criticism of it misses and why I think uh, getting rid of it would be quite the problem. On the one hand, uh, there's Justice Scalia, 
Now, everyone hears a lot about his view on Lemon because uh, he had that snappy line about it being a ghoul, um, like a monster from a, a movie that just won't die and kind of pops up again and again. Um, so that's usually the thing that you really hear about his opinion on, uh, on Lemon. But take what he said in his dissent in McCreary, um, which is a, an important case dealing with, with Lemon. There he rejected the idea um, that government cannot endorse religion over non-religion. Um, he rejected the idea that government can't endorse religion. Um, and when specifically addressing the Ten Commandments, he reasoned that because close to 98% of all believers in the U.S. think that the Ten Commandments come from the divine, it should be fine for the government to display them. Now think about what that, what, what that message is to the 2% of believers who don't think that the Ten Commandments are divine. Uh, think about what message that sends to non-believers in the country. And take into account that those numbers are always shifting, right? Think about the difference in those numbers from the founding to now. Now compare that to Justice O'Connor, who in uh, her concurrence in the same case, said that the First Amendment is not a head-counting exercise. It's not a matter of you know, whether the majority of people think that this is a message from the divine. She reasoned that if we start allowing line drawing between religions, then why not allow line drawing between religious sects as well, right? Where does it stop? In a recent case, actually, um, Kennedy versus Bremerton, it's one of the cases that's before the court right now. Um, some folks might have heard about it. It involved a football coach praying at the 50-yard line uh, at the end of uh, football games at a public high school. It's one of the two cases that's been mentioned up here um, that does present the potential for the court to weigh in again uh, on Lemon. At oral argument, um, Justice Gorsuch was asking counsel for um, the district, which Americans United represents, uh, so my colleague and boss, Richard Katsky, um, was asking, Justice Gorsuch was asking about, about Lemon, right, and, and kind of what role Lemon plays and whether it should finally be put to bed. And uh, Justice Breyer jumped in and said something along the lines of, you know, look, take Lemon and all of its imperfections and just think about what it's trying to do. Um, it's trying to stop divisiveness on the basis of religion. Um, and, you know, I think that is a valid goal. It was a valid goal when Lemon was issued. Uh, it's a valid goal now. Um, and I think it's actually an especially valid goal now to try to break down divisiveness uh, among religious beliefs and the non-religious as opposed uh, to getting rid of the test and increasing that divisiveness. So <clears throat> the other speakers have touched on this a little bit. Why hasn't the court gotten rid of Lemon? Um, you know, it's addressed it in probably eight cases in the last 30 years, um, very rarely in kind terms. Um, I think that part of the reason it hasn't gotten rid of it is very much the same reason that the court refused to overturn Smith uh, in Fulton. Some of you might have been in the presentation this morning on that. Um, and if you look at Justice Barrett's concurrence there, the long and short of it is, okay, we overturn it, but what do we replace it with, right? There, there is a value to it. Some people are open to replacing it, but they're just not sure what they're gonna replace it with. Um, and so I think that's a big part of the reason that the court hasn't gotten five justices together in any single case to say, all right, let's put Lemon to bed. Here's going to be the replacement. I just think it's a, a very, very tough task. Um, and I will say, as much consternation as there has been about Lemon and as much kind of talk about it as there's been at the Supreme Court, there... I don't believe that there's a single justice who thinks that Lemon is the only test under the Establishment Clause. Um, that might have been the case in, in you know, past years. I just don't think that's the case now. Um, justice Breyer, who is one of the kind of most strident defenders of Lemon, uh, has said very explicitly, I do not think that Lemon is the only test. Um, but it is still valuable. Um, you know, the other thing is we haven't seen a court of appeals offer 
a, a reasonable substitute, right? There's been nothing that's been teed up to the court that gives the court kind of an easy way to overturn Lemon and have some coherent body of law. What we've seen instead is kind of a smattering of approaches offered. Um, we just heard some of them. Um, but the difficulty in applying those or choosing when one of those tests applies to something and what one of the other tests applies to something else, you know, often involves a lot of the same difficult questions that people complain about with Lemon, right? They involve subjective decisions of uh, when something should fall under this test and when something should fall under that test. Um, I'll focus on one of the prevailing tests, uh, and that's the, the history and tradition tests. Um, now, as I said, there's difficult decisions as to when a test applies and when it doesn't. Justice Gorsuch um, is nothing if not consistent, uh, and he clearly wants this to be the only test. This, the, he wants this to be the Establishment Clause test. Um, but I do think that raises just as many questions, right, as, as it does anything else. Um, <clears throat> first, and I think most obviously, is whose history and tradition? Um, you know, standing here at BYU, we know that there's been a long history and tradition uh, in this country of religious discrimination, um, you know, against religious minorities especially, including the Latter-day Saints. And is that the sort of history and tradition that we think is okay under the Establishment Clause? Um, you know, again, I'll, I'll quote Justice Scalia. This, this time I'll actually quote him. <clears throat> he was also, if, you know, most often consistent. He said, quote, it is entirely clear from our nation's historical practices <clears throat> that the Establishment Clause permits disregard of polytheists and believers and unconcerned de deities, just as it permits the disregard of devout atheists. And I think as a historical matter, he's right. But is that what we want as our test under the Establishment Clause, right? Do we think that that's the proper way we should interpret the law uh, because that's what we did historically? What I'll say about the kind of the ease of the history and tradition test, because this is one that you hear a lot about, is that in my eyes, any time that someone provides uh, an objective legal test that easily answers all sorts of questions, you should be suspicious. Um, it either leads to untenable results or it leads to the same kind of judgment calls that people you know, complain about with Lemon. So let me make that a little more concrete. Does anyone really want the history and tradition test to apply in every circumstance? Because again, as I just mentioned a minute ago, if so, you're going to get um, a, a test that allows repeating some of the worst moments in our country's history the, and towards how we treat religious minorities especially. If not, then the question is when do we apply the history and tradition tests? Not when it gives us one of those awful results, obviously, but now we're back to the exact problem of making judgment calls, right? Then it just becomes a, a test that we decide to apply when it gives us the answer that we want. And that's precisely part of why Lemon is criticized, for being the one-size-fits-all test that people just apply to get the answer that they want. As a result, it you know, arguably produces some difficulty in its application but I don't think that we should shy away from embracing the anti-divisive um, reason underlying Lemon. It's what the Establishment Clause does at its best. And if that's the issue that folks have with Lemon, then I think that's the conversation that should be had, not which, uh, which legal test is kind of the best one. I'll finish with a quote from Justice O'Connor and, and her concurrence in McCreary, because I do think this is, um, a perspective that has kind of been a bit lost by the court, but one that is really important and I think we should always be thinking about when considering the Establishment Clause. She said, quote, those who renegotiate the boundaries between church and state must therefore answer a difficult question. Why would we trade a system that has served us so well for one that has served others so poorly? Thank you. Well, I think we've been uh, we've been very well taught, and we uh, we appreciate the very thoughtful presentations by Daniel and Steve and and, and Bradley.
Um, I can I, I can imagine Daniel and uh, and Bradley arguing arguing cases against each other on these on these issues. Both very persuasive, and uh, um, th this is a great thing. We've got some time for questions from the audience, um, so we thank our panelists for that as well. Uh, would you all like a minute to respond to each other, or should we go right to audience questions? I'll let I'll let the three of you decide. Okay. All right, so who has questions? Yes. My audience question is really just to ask Daniel if you wouldn't mind responding to Bradley. <laughs> <laughs> on the question of determining history, right? So for example, using Bradley's example of, of the, uh, the Mormon war in Missouri, um, you know, they appealed for federal help, didn't get it. Would that set a precedent then? The federal government didn't seem to I know it's not, at the time it was ratified, and I Sure. Um, I, I think if your approach to understanding what does an establishment of religion mean, if your approach is one that's looking to history, the question is not, you know, everything that we've done for a long time is okay and things that are new are bad. I, I, don't, I don't think that's how an approach that, that looks to history works. I, in terms of you know, the words, there's lots of different schools of thought within kind of a broad umbrella of originalism or, or things like that. As far as the Establishment Clause is concerned, one help, it, that's, I think, an area that's particularly useful to look at what did people understand an establishment of religion was. Not because everything that people, not because everything that was done in the past is good or we should keep doing, but because people at the time of the founding knew what it meant to have an establishment of religion. That was, that was a specific concept that people were familiar with. And so, yeah, persecuting, persecuting minority religions, that happened in the past, and it's bad. And people, and, and is also a characteristic of established churches. So, I mean, that's, that's one instance where looking at, uh, at what did an establishment of religion mean historically helps you answer, yes, like persecuting people who did, were not adherents of the established church, that's exactly part of what an establishment of religion means. Um, and so I, I, one, one other approach that's connected to that historical analysis that I know a lot of folks at BYU have, have spent a lot of time on is this uh, corpus linguistics analysis where looking at historical databases of how particular terms were used um, at specific times in history and, and seeing, uh, adding a layer of rigor to that analysis of what, what does a certain term mean and not just relying on maybe kind of our assumptions or our intuition of what a particular term would mean. Uh, but in, in short, an establishment of religion is something that people at the founding were familiar with, what it was. Because it existed, they saw it, they experienced it. And so it, it's... It's something where looking to what was understood to fall within that definition is a particularly, I, I think, one helpful way of understanding that clause today. Thank you. Can I just say one thing? Okay? Yeah, and Bradley, uh, we'll give you a chance to respond to if you like. Uh, one thought I had on this is just, um, you know, the, the problem or the risk, I think this is what Bradley was getting at, uh, although I don't want to put words in your mouth, is that with a history and tradition test, I mean, it's infinitely malleable, right? And, and, and you really can get to any, any outcome you want. One way it's malleable is how you look at something in history, the level of generality with which you look at it. So if you look at historically, very specific, what were the practices, you could get away with all sorts of horrible things today. If you go up a little a layer in generality, I think you could make the argument that the history and tradition is exactly what Bradley said it was. The point of it was to avoid religious divisiveness, right? The problem is we don't have a clear understanding of how we would apply a history and tradition test. I mean, it's easy for the court just to throw that out. But we don't have a clear understanding as to what level of generality we're going to use. Whose history and tradition? What about black churches among enslaved people at the time? What about Native American religions? How are we going to treat all of this right when we analyze all of this? Those are all questions that you have to answer 
when you're going to employ a history and tradition test that really we haven't come to any settled agreement upon of how we're going to do it. Um, that put some of what I was going to say better than I could, so uh, I appreciate that. <clears throat> but, yeah, I mean, this gets a, a little bit to my point about why I think we should be suspicious of anything that is a test that is, it's objective, it's easy to apply. Because what that is doing to me, and, and this isn't just a history and tradition um, test issue that I have, it's, I think, with this kind of way of approaching the law and thinking about the law, it just, it, it kicks judgment, it kicks the can of judgment down the road, or it hides it, right? So instead of being open about the judgment that we're making and why we're doing what we're doing, it says, oh, well, history and tradition did this. But again, it, it gets these questions of, history and tradition being infinitely malleable, which points of it. I think history and tradition and linguistics can be very useful tools. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you just ignore it. Um, but I do think that because of their malleability, it just becomes a way to get to some results-driven answer, but kind of cloaked with the idea that, oh, no, what we're doing is just like real rigorous analysis when people who are thinking about lemon are just doing kind of loosey-goosey analysis. And then the other thing I, I think just related to that point is that there's so many contexts in which this sort of, these sorts of questions come up for which there is no uh, historical reference. And so, sure, we can try to think about historical references, but then it's just, again, it's just judgment. Right? Oh, well, I think that this is very similar. So to give it a concrete example, um, I'll use Kennedy versus Bremerton again. This is the, the praying football coach case. There was a lot of talk about, like, okay, well, how does any sort of historical analysis apply here? Right? Football wasn't around. There wasn't high school football. There wasn't the potential of a coach coercing the high school team by saying it, or implying, if you don't pray with me, you don't get playing time. That's a, that's a modern problem. And so what part of history do you look to to determine if that's okay historically? And that's a judgment. Uh, so they can be valuable tools, but I, I think it kind of has to end there. We can't treat it as everything. Yes, over here. I mean, <clears throat> I have yet to hear one that I think kind of answers everything. Um, as a general matter, I guess this might not be surprising considering what I just said. Um, I'm suspicious of one-size-fits-all tests for everything. I think we do need to look at the underlying reasoning, kind of why the Establishment Clause exists. And there might be circumstances that arise in which we have to apply or come up with a new test as opposed to, you know, kind of square square peg round hole sort of thing yeah I, I i don't think that there's one you know one articulation of one test that is going to answer all these questions what and i'll give a concrete example of uh an area of the establishment clause that the court has talked about a couple of times in the last decade or so is um the ministerial exception so the principle that um, both the Free Exercise Clause and the Establishment Clause work together to prevent the government from interfering in religious groups' decision of who is going to convey their message and who's going to carry on their important religious functions. In that instance, uh, to those cases that, you know, the court never cited Lemon, um, and, and so the, this principle of the ministerial exception has, has grown out of both the Free Exercise Clause and the Establishment Clause working together to protect religious liberty, but the principles specifically in the ministerial exception are not applied to display cases or government funding of religious organizations cases. So they are principles that are specific to that, to that area of law. So in, in, in that sense, yes, I think, I think probably all of us agree that there's not, there's not one, you know, one easy answer to, ev to every one of these cases. But, but even in that context, the court was still guided by looking at why do we have the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause? What were they understood to do historically? 
And they, they drew that principle of the ministerial exception from a broader, you know, historical analysis. But, but yes, it, I, I agree. There's, there's not, you know, a one size fits all approach for every single case. I think we have time for one more question. And you had your hand up I'll first. Well, I'm laughing because people, every time I speak, people ask me for a defi legal definition of religion. And there are, not to disparage my profession uh, as a law professor, but there are probably 50 or 60 law review articles written about the definition of religion for every case where it actually matters. It's something that's rich, right? How do we define it? Where on the spectrum do we go from just a straight up human philosophy or belief to something that is clearly religion? And, and where are the boundaries? It's very, very difficult to figure out. So the definition of religion matters a lot. Uh, I would just tell you that in the vast majority of cases, it's not truly an issue. It's something that academics spend a lot of time thinking about. But in most of the cases, and you guys just jump in if you disagree, I think the vast majority of cases, it's pretty clear if you're dealing with a religion. Now, there are, there are exceptions to, to that. For example, there's a lot of prisoner cases where you'll get, say, white supremacists coming along and saying, we should get special treatment under the statutes that protect prisoners because our white supremacy is a religion. And courts have to deal with that and ask, is this a sincere religion? Is it a sincere religious beliefs? And, and usually they find a way to rule against the prisoners in those situations. But so it, it does come up, but it just doesn't come up nearly as much as you might think it would, if that makes sense. And, yeah, yeah just, just one little one little thing. I think it is a very good question that we could talk about for hours in terms of cases like that, whether the court should find that it's a religion but find some way to deny relief uh, or just find it's not a religion. But as a purely practical matter in litigation, most people do not challenge that something is a religion. And they don't challenge that something is a religious belief. It's just they know it's a nightmare for the litigants. It's a nightmare for the courts. Nobody wants to get into arguments about whether somebody really believes something or not. So for the most, for the most part, at least in our cases, and I'm guessing it's similar in yours, it's just, OK, we'll we will assume, even for this case, that this is a religious practice and go from there. What does that mean? So one thing I would add, though, is that I think this is a major question. So we live in an era of, of if, I don't know if you've heard the term expressive individualism, right? But this, you know, this kind of belief that the only truth comes from the self, not from some outside divine source. Is that a religion? Should it be treated as a religion? If it is a religion, should it be prohibited from being taught or promoted or, or endorsed or coerced in, in public schools, right? And, and, and if it is a religion, how do we draw that line? That's something I think about all the time. I have not come up with a principled, good way of defining religion that would help us get to that question about expressive individualism. But I think it's a crucial question for the era in which we live right now. Why don't we give Daniel the last word? Uh, this. This question of what constitutes a religion, this particular issue that, that I'm going to talk about, hasn't come up to my knowledge in cases, but it's one that comes up in popular discourse and I think is unfortunate. And that's a segment of people that say that certain minority religions, specifically Islam, is not a religion. It's, it's a political philosophy. And, and some people who are typically very strong supporters of religious liberty are try to exempt, try to carve off Islam from being protected uh, by religious liberty by saying it's not a religion, by saying that it's a political philosophy that's at odds with Western civilization or something along those lines. I've never seen a, a, a case where a party argued that, but people write about that. That's something that people talk about, and I think it's really unfortunate uh, in, you know, just in trying to ostracize someone's religion because they're different and just saying that they're not a religion at all. So thankfully, that's not something that seems to be gaining in any purchase legally, but it, it is kind of a, a sad story that, that happening in society and one that I, I think, um, you know, at a place like BYU where people understand very well the history of religious persecution of minorities, that's something I think we can all uh, stand against and, um, and promoting religious liberty for people of all faiths. Well, let's have one last round of applause for our panel. Um,